Bro, tonight, if I want to go in my freezer and get like a, a jar of peanut butter and just eat the whole thing or mix it with some ice, I can do that. Right. Totally fine. If I just want to just wake up tomorrow morning and just sit on my couch and, and spam like any show that I want or, or all our animes that we watch, I can just do that if right. I want. Right. You know, and then I can just go work out. But I love, and I know you do too. I love what I do. Yeah. You're listening to the PJF Podcast, a show dedicated to decoding elite sports performance and fitness. I'm Paul Favorites, and I'm an NBA strength and conditioning and performance trainer. If you want to become superhuman, take your fitness, and take your sports performance to the next level, this is the podcast for you. Let's do it. We got my man Dev in the lab, in the building. Um, Thanks for being here, Dev. Really appreciate it. So Dev and I have been real close for past, what, maybe five? I don't even know how long it's been. Yeah. So I, I feel like you and I knew about each other for a long time. Yeah. We were watching each other's stuff, but we never had the official introduction. And then Adidas brought us to Portland. Yeah. That was the first one, right? No, yeah. or was it Vegas? No, it was Vegas. Vegas. And and then and then Portland. Right, right, right. Yeah. Yeah, so they brought us all to Vegas. We all got to hoop, meet, uh, pick each other's brains. Um, and then Dev and I have been close ever since. Yeah. Um, so let's start off, just give your story. I mean, I think everybody in the basketball community knows a little bit about your story. Yeah. Um, everybody's seen you at some point on YouTube. I can pretty much guarantee that. Um, but for anybody who doesn't know your story, uh, how do you, how do you get started? It's kind of like weird to think about where it started off from because, and I always go back and forth on it, uh, because it's been so long. Yeah. Since that, you know, we've been doing this for a long time. How long have you been on YouTube? Ten. Yeah, 10 years. it's been a long time. Yeah. So ten years is a good amount of time. And so, um, I guess it started off where I'm finishing. Like I went to college. I went to Fresno State right before Paul George went there. Got hurt. Didn't play a game. Um, and then you know I was kind of like frustrated where to go. And bad knees, tendonitis, couldn't jump, couldn't put a bed sheet on my knee without feeling it. Like that's mm-hmm. how bad it was. Yeah. And so then I went to uh, Skyline JC and uh, played some good games there. Ended up with a few D two offers. And when I was there, I'm just like, you know what, man, this basketball stuff might not work out. Like especially with I can't even jog without my knees hurting Mm -hmm. i can't sit in the car for too long before my knees start aching and pain and you know so i was like you know what let me just figure something else out right so i was just happening to make like these funny like home videos and somebody gave me a camera and uh it it just it was just like some random for fun with kids and you know a lot of people don't notice but i ended up on (laughs) i can't I ended up on the Oprah Winfrey show. What? So basically, so basically it was an accident. So I we were making videos and it was like making kids like pass out. Like we're it's like our family. So we were yeah. pressed against like the neck and we we're <laughs> like all my cousins and me, I was in there passing out. And so then there was a, a video on Oprah and she was just like, We gotta stop these kids from doing this and <laughs> And it was it was us like making making each other so it's like random fact of the day right? Wow! Oh uh, yeah, I, I made it for all the wrong reasons. That's and so that's and your so, first time like ever going. Viral. Yeah, and so it wasn't even viral. It was just like random. Like well, if it's no, Oprah, I, that's the, like the, the top. The video didn't even get that many views. Like it's really? like it's like still sitting at like in the hundreds. Damn! And I, so I really want to watch that video. Yeah, I'm, I'm gonna Is show it, it still to you. Out there? Yeah, I'm gonna. Yeah. Show, it's, it's still out. It's blocked now. I, I, I like I'm like block, I made it private. And so long story short, um, I kind of got in the video. And I went to the Academy of Art because my mom was a graphic designer. So that's why I picked, I picked the Academy of Art because they had just started a basketball team and they were looking for players and they had one year under their belt. So like when I went there, um, they were or when I when I was thinking about going there, they were like, yeah, you can go to school um, and then also play basketball on a scholarship. So I'm like, oh, this is no brainer because my mom was a graphic designer. I kind of familiar with Photoshop. And all this type of stuff. So I'm like, I'm gonna go to I'm gonna go to San Francisco and then learn how to do all this graphic design stuff, right? So basically what happened when I got there, it was just a whole different setup. Like it was just like any new program program, things are gonna be a little bit haywire, right? Mm-hmm. So like we didn't have a gym to practice at, so we had to go to Keysar Stadium. I don't know if you guys know who that, where that is, but Keysar Stadium is like legendary out there in San Francisco. They play all the pro am games there. So we didn't really and but we couldn't go there like how you go to a practice gym at a at a college. We couldn't go there like that. It was just like 
are a lot of time. Mm -hmm. So if you want to put in extra work, you were just, yeah. you couldn't really do it. Then on top of that, the teachers and everybody, so the school had been going on for a long time. The basketball wasn't. So they didn't really want athletes. They didn't really care for athletes like that mm -hmm. because they're like, how are athletes artists? You know, it doesn't really make sense. Right. And so what happened was I started taking graphic design my first year and all they, they try to weave you out like, to, to separate everybody from the serious and not so serious, I was right out of there. It wasn't even because I was serious. It just wasn't my passion. Mm -hmm. And I found that out quick. So I got into editing videos. Um, and it was, a, it was a whole long process. Long story short, I just went to this lady who was a part of multimedia uh, par department who had just started. They had just started up like two years before. And they were just like, so what do you want to do? And I was like, I like video. And she's just, uh, her name is Jan Yana Hero. She was a news anchor and she was a, the head of the department there. And so she just gave me all these like options and different ways. And they had never did this for anybody before. Like, okay, we'll put you in this other department so you could take this editing class because they didn't, they didn't have that. And it was all these little things that she did for me that really ended up working out to where I started editing videos. So we're going through the season. The first season, we didn't win one game. We played 27 games, then went one game. Wow. Like, not one can, – can you imagine I went one game for a whole – we didn't win one game. We're at <laughs> art school. And it wasn't that – like, we had a few, like, D1 players on the team. We just mm -hmm. couldn't put it together. One of our D1 players was the shortest player in NCAA history. He was, like, 5'3". Really? What? Yeah, his name was Lance Olivier. And then him and his dad run the Soldiers. That's crazy. The, so, the uh, yeah, Oakland, Oakland Soldiers yeah. program. And so – yeah, he's like really good, really good dude. He's nice too. We just couldn't put together a win, right? And so the next year we started winning some more games. Uh, but then that year after, so I had only played one year at JC. Cause remember, I didn't play at Fresno State for two years. I got hurt, mm -hmm. so I played one year at JC, two years at the art school, and then I was supposed to have an extra year, but they didn't give it back to me because I did five years. Or uh, it was I was in college for five years. Right. So I was trying to fight for that year back, didn't get it. Mm. So it was kind of like what every athlete goes through. Yep. Where do you go from here? Yep. You know? And so me, I couldn't, I wasn't competing at a high level because my knees, I wasn't able to dump my, so this ran, another random fact, my dad was a White Sox. So like Chicago White Sox. Yeah, yeah. random, right? So right. like I got my speed from him. Mm. I didn't have to work for it. This is going to connect to something I'm going to tell you in the future though. So like, Basically, long story short, even it's just a really long story, but um, things didn't work out, uh, and then I ended up just really taking this editing stuff serious. So I was amongst like really good editors that were at the Academy of Art, but I was just doing better than them. And we had the same footage to edit, and I would just do it better. And the teachers would give me a lot of credit, and I was getting a lot of like hate off of it because like, how could an athlete do this? Yeah, you know when you, he hasn't been doing this his whole life, you know. And so uh, I got a chance to really like start showing my videos. And then the first video that I had edited, another thing, I was doing memes and like funny videos. Before I, I always tell people nobody believes me. I was doing those videos before anybody, yeah. and I have proof of it. Like during MySpace, yeah. and like because I because I knew how to Photoshop, right. and so I was like always sending my friend like stuff in group chats. Yeah. So I wish I'd have posted it on social media because yeah. I would I'd have probably been known for you it. Started the whole thing, bro. I'm telling you, like what's funny? You know how like. Like uh, when Pacquiao got knocked out and they put him on a sleep mattress, yeah. I would do stuff like that all the time. <laughs> right. But it was just like me and my friends just having fun because we were in a Photoshop class. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I was I started making funny videos. But the first video that I shot that I was serious was 10,000 hours. Mm -hmm. And the story goes, I was done playing, but I would go around and hoop. And I can only hoop over like one time, two times a week because of how my knees were set up. Yeah. And I didn't have no any information on how to fix them. Right. I just knew like. There was no information at that time. No. I mean, you go to the doctor and they just say like uh, ice and rest. Well, let me tell you, you know? what they told me. So they told me to do ice and rest. But hey, doctors like this is in high school. This one started, started in 11th grade. I had a few D1 uh, offers. They were just like, you know what? Just take 900, uh, 900, three pills a, uh, a meal of ibuprofen. Mm. So I was doing that for like two years. Yeah. And so like there, and somebody finally told me, you need to stop doing that because you're going to knock out your kidneys. Yeah, it's not good for you. Yeah. <laughs> and, and so I was doing that thinking that I was getting better. 
And I wasn't getting better because it was just alleviating the pain. And then when you stop taking it, it comes back tenfold. Yep. It's like a, almost like taking what's that uh, shot that you get? Like the cortisone. Cortisone. Yeah. It's like cortisone. So when that wears off, mm -hmm. it's like it's right. like really bad. Right. So I would only play a few times a week, but I was going down to this gym called MBH, which is now known as another gym in Millbrae, or it was in Burlington. It was one of those. And I would hoop and I had handles and everybody like you know like watching me play. And so there was this kid that would come up, and he was going to – it wasn't Cal Baptist. It was like Monterey, something Monterey. It was a D2, or he was uh, about to go there. And then he came to me. He was like, hey, yo, like, I want to, like, work out. And, you know, I have a little brother that would love to work out too. Like, can you guys train me? Or can you train me? I'm like, well, I don't know nothing about training. I used to think training was stupid. Yeah. So I grew up in the N one generation where we always just, just – we used to hoop. Just play. That's all it was. It was just hooping. So, yeah. like, that was, to me, that was training. Mm -hmm. Like, why go do all this stuff by yourself when – you know, you're going to be playing with nine other people. So, like, that's that was how I got my training. But, like, see, this is how I used to think. I had no clue of how things actually worked and, you know, uh, having a schedule and sticking to that schedule. I just knew play basketball, play basketball, play basketball. Mm -hmm. And that's the reason why I kind of got the handle. I was on the street. Mm -hmm. And so I was like, dude, like, why do you want me to train you? And he was just like, I don't know. I mean, you're just you're kind of good. And, it's like, I want handles like that. So we started training. Finally, I was like, whatever. So we started training, and we were just – it was so much fun. And um, I started seeing them get better. That's when it kind of became like, okay, this is sick. And they would go in their games, and they would average a certain amount of points, and they started setting three-point records and, you know, started shooting. And, and for me, for shooting, like, I always had a – I never really knew how to shoot, but I knew how to teach people. How to, right. I, I can't yeah. explain why. I just knew how to teach people how to shoot. Mm -hmm. And the reason why – actually, I do know why. It was The reason why, it was because there was this game where we played against – it was right before we played against losing or Russell Westbrook. And I just decided – because I watched a lot of Kobe. I just decided I'm going to jump really high on my jumper – and then just shoot it really high because Kobe had a flat shot, yep. but like I wasn't as tall as Kobe. Yep. So I ran off like six threes in the first half. So that was my biggest memory. And then, and then when my knees, so days when my knees would feel good, we played against a team called Mission Prep in, in the playoffs in, high, in my high school. And it led us to winning a ring for Price High School. I did the same thing. I was knocking down threes, hitting clutch shots. So that always stuck in my head, right? Later down the line, I was like, I don't really have to jump this high, but like, when I was teaching those guys, they started really like, and I was showing, okay, this is how you really become a good shooter. We're going to work on this, boom, boom. Mm -hmm. And they started shooting that thing. They'll tell you the same way. I told them. And so, like, with the handles and everything, they started putting the th things together. Kyle, his name is Kyle Wong. He got a scholarship to Cal Baptist. And for me, that was, like, one of the biggest things. When he got that scholarship, I was like, wow, like, what we're doing is actually really working. Little did I know there was more to basketball than just dribbling and shooting. And, you know, you got pick and roll. We kind of worked on that, but it was mostly handles, you know. Mm -hmm. And so there were things that happened that in their career that I was like, you know what, that's my fault because they would have – been coming off of more picks and handoffs mm -hmm. and learning where to go on the court. Instead, they were trying to go ISO. Now, I worked at the high school, and I helped them get to certain situations. But when you get to the next level and everybody is good as you, yeah. you can't really do all that type of stuff. Everybody's taller than you. Everybody's stronger than you. You have to be smarter. I didn't really understand that with them. Mm -hmm. So um, I learned from a lot of mis those mistakes. But – at the same time as I was training them, I was asked to make a video on like a day in a life type project. And I made this whole series or I made I made a video about just what was going on. Like, wake up, brush your teeth, mm -hmm. um, go here, train here. And we were actually training like three times a day. What, what's rest? Yeah. You know, I'll rest when I'm dead. Right. So we were just training, 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 and I was making a video about it, the whole process, and, and it was working for them. They were getting good, like I said. So it turned into them getting hurt <laughs> because we weren't resting, but it motivated everybody. Mm -hmm. So I put the, I showed this video to class. It did terrible. I got a bad grade on it. 
Um, but like the pe- the kids liked it. Mm-hmm. It's like when when you see a movie and the critics give it Bro, a terrible score all the time, and then and then the audience gives it a really good all score. The time. If I see Rotten Tomatoes ranks it like a three out of ten, yeah, I'm in there. I'm probably gonna, <laughs> I'm probably gonna you like give it. it a chance. Yeah. But but if it's if both of them are high, it's like oh for sure. Yeah. yeah. But the, it was like that for me. That was kind of discouraging, but it wasn't at the same time. But here's the story. So I saved the video on YouTube because I didn't have a hard drive. I didn't have any money. I saw. I always tell people I know what it's like to be broke because my parents were just like, "We're not gonna help you." Yeah. They were never rich, but they were never poor. Mm-hmm. But they were just like, "We're not gonna help you. You figure it out." They would Same help here. me if I really, really needed it because they yeah. know they know me. Right. But I was like prideful. I was like, "No, I want my own money. I want to do this. I want to do that." Yeah. And so, like, I remember having negative. Like when you don't have any money, your uh, bank you over withdraw all the time. And so, like, you know, they would hit you for like twenty five dollar, fifty dollar, whatever the fee is. That was me. I was getting hit by the. I didn't know what the heck to yeah. do. So I posted that video and somebody contacted me. They were like, hey, yo, your video is on Reddit. And I didn't know what Reddit was. So I didn't really think nothing about it. And then somebody hit me up later on. It's just like I'm kind of breezing through it. Um, somebody hit me up later on. It was just like, yo, your, your video is on the front page of YouTube. So I'm like, what? So I'm looking and the views are just steadily going up. And I have my, my emails connected to my phone. Mm-hmm. So like, my phone is dying so fast. Like I will wake up at eight and get to school at ten thir- and get to school at ten thirty because I had some stuff to do. And then and then my phone would be dead by the time because my phone zzz, 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 new subscriber, new right. subscriber, new subscriber. I didn't know to turn it over, how to turn <laughs> notifications off. I just thought it was so sick that that many people were like locking in of what I was doing. So I'm like. Well, I guess I'll make another video then. <laughs> right. And so had I not said, had I had a hard drive, it would have never blew up. Mm-hmm. So, um, and like I said, that video did not do well in class. My teacher tore me apart. He knew I had potential, but he he wanted to be very strict just so that I could start fixing up on these things. And so that the rest is history Honestly, from there. Honestly, though, like, I remember when I first saw your videos and I, I saw how raw it was. Yeah. It was like it was edited, but there yeah. you felt like you were there. Yeah, that's what if, I wanted. If you wanted, if you got an A, if you needed to get an A in class, they probably would have wanted it very straightforward, yeah. less raw. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. more polished. It was. And that wouldn't have connected with the right. basketball community. No, not necessarily. And, and that was my thing because I grew up, I, what I was pretty much duplicating is what I saw from Am One and on like Street Ball. They used to have these episodes that came on, I think, every Tuesday or Wednesday on ESPN. It was Street Ball episodes. And that's what I was duplicating. I used to I used to be outside um of foot action and waiting for the new shoe to drop so that I can get, buy the shoe, the Am One shoe, and get the mixtape. Yeah. So that was me. Or I'd go outside of Best Buy and wait for this video to drop in Best Buy and I would call Best Buy has it, has it came in yet? Mm-hmm. Oh no. Has it came in yet? No. Has it came okay, yeah, I'm near. Right. So I go pick the you know and, and then study it. That was my first like that's how I used to watch film. I you know, I had to actually physically press rewind yeah. and watch it have to rewind take hella long. Like Bro, kids don't know how nah. hard it was for us. Like nah. you I would see a move from Iverson and I would just have to pray that I saw it later on on right. ESPN. Exactly. Because I'm not gonna see that move ever nah. again. And so it's like you got to watch it and then be like, okay, I remember exactly what that was like and then right. go out and rep it out. Right. But now you're just – you got it on your phone. It's easy. Even more, you got trainers breaking it down step by step yeah. on your phone the it's same easy. night that it happens. Yeah. It's crazy. And so, like, I, I would always argue that basketball, in terms of basketball, things are more skilled nowadays. Yeah. Like, it it would be stupid if it wasn't because everything's on the internet being like you just said being broke down and you can you can watch you can go see what people are doing in New York and different moves that they're doing you can see what people are doing in California or Europe and right. there's no problem like it, you could just sit right here on your phone and look all that stuff up you couldn't do that when uh you know when I was on the one mixtapes and all so so like that's how I kind of came into things and when I went into training I was applying some of that that style into the train. That's what people really mess with, mm-hmm. you know, because what sells now, and I, my whole thing has changed now, but my whole, uh, my style is what sells, um, you know, the videos and what makes you want to watch it and the hard work and the inspiration. Mm-hmm. So I started understanding that early on. So to, to really fast forward things, those kids that I train, had they not been Chinese, they just happened to be Chinese. Had they not, I would have never, 
been uh, nothing would have went viral because what happened is the the guys that watched it they were working in Adidas and they were just connected to the culture out there. Mm. They just happened to be working in, in the grassroots and they contacted me. They contacted me and it was just like, pretty much, we want to bring you out to China. Now, this is a story I can't really go over and I can't name who, certain things I can't say. But they didn't. They were trying to reach me for a long time. And I found this out through them. They were trying to reach me for a long time, right? But they couldn't, so they went to another guy. And, and the guy who knew who I was, right? And so the guys from China came out. And they uh, they contacted the guy and they were like, we're going to come out and train with you. I got all this on video too, right? And so they ended up coming out and he was, this this trainer was kind of like the, the quarterback of everything. He received the payments, he negotiated the deals, and we went out and trained. And so we we did this and then they came up to me, he's like, oh, we want to bring you out to China. And like, we want you to work out and run this whole tour. And... It's certain things I can't say, but I got paid pennies for that, mm -hmm. and they kept the bulk share of that. Mm -hmm. And I was, it really hurt me for a long time because I really supported what this guy did. Mm -hmm. So anyways, they brought me out to China, and they asked me to run this tour through China where we picked players up throughout the city. And this is where I made the video. Like This really went viral. It was back, called Back to Zero. And I'm skipped, I skipped over all the episode three and four with Christian Carson and all that stuff. But um, they wanted me to run this whole tour. And I'm just like, dang, like they're trusting me to do this. And I don't even know what I'm doing still. Mm -hmm. Like I know how to train. I know how to teach people how to get handled. But I really don't know the game like that. Mm -hmm. And so I'm just like, but they said they're going to pay me a certain amount. I'm like, okay. <laughs> I didn't even negotiate. Yeah. I didn't even like, okay, this is, I, I want this much. They were just like, I, it was just more money than I had ever seen in my life. Right. And this was like a few years out of college. Mm -hmm. So I'm like, cool, let's, let's, let's get it done. What are we waiting on? Yeah. So I go out to China and it's just like something that I've never experienced before. It was just a different type of culture and the food and how they were living and just certain things you can't say and can't do and you can. It was just beautiful to me. I loved it out there in China. And I'm, I'm, we're going to these different cities, and I'm seeing how different each city is. And it was beautiful. And, and then to find out that everybody really knew who I was. Yeah. So in China, you can't – so, like, say, like, Derrick Rose. And I've seen this. He can't go to – or Harden. I've seen it with Harden, too. He can't go be somewhere for that long. No. He, it's like he has like 45 minutes to be at this event, and then he got to take off. Right. He may like shoot some jumpers, but it's never like too much, right? Derrick Rose, he, was, he went out there and was playing one-on-one -on -one and then took off. Kobe, same thing. But um, I couldn't go certain places because they would gather like a, like a big crowd because people knew who I was. Yeah. You know, and I'm just like, well, I'm not even this popular in the U.S. That's what I'm saying. Yeah. And when so, I first went to Hong Kong, yeah. it, like people would notice me every now and then here. Yeah. I went to Hong Kong and I'm checking into my hotel and the guy's like, wait, this is you. Yeah. He pulled me up on Instagram. Yeah. It's like everywhere I went, they knew me there. Like way before right. America knew about me. So, and it comes to find out that their culture is where like the street ball and outdoor stuff and just the hype and everything. It's where we used to be. And they haven't like yeah. they're still there in like the street and it's so much fun to play basketball. So anyways, going through all these cities and packed out crowd, I would send out a text or, or something on the social media out there and an hour later a thousand people would show up at the court and watch us play basketball. That's like that's not like yeah. realistic out here that's in some not places. Happen out here. Unless you're like Kobe or something. I mean, not Kobe, but right, you right. know, LeBron or whoever else. Yeah. So you know, like only they're able to do things like that. Yep. Um, I could do it on a small scale, but not like that. Not yeah. like out in China. So after going through that whole tour, it just made me feel like this world is so big and there's so much to to learn out there. Um I even learned so I always would see the older people out there, they're just walking around like at 90 years old and, you know, they're doing Tai Chi and they're walking with the hands behind their back and they're walking backwards and all kind of little things. It's like, how are they able to do it? So I, I was study from them. 
and and just learn like how are you able to and they're like yeah we just stay active yeah you know we build like so like there was talking about walking backwards i was like why you do that because it's building muscles up here and we're walking straight our whole lives but we never build it to go backwards and you know like opening our our shoulders up like they wake up and do arm circles Mm -hmm. forward and backwards a certain amount of times and their arms just work better (laughs) it's like we just stay they just say we they said we stay active, mm-hmm. so they don't they don't sit in chairs. And no, much. like they'll squat. No, they have the ability to deep squat at age eighty. You know, this was the funniest thing to me. So I would when I first got out there, we were just driving. It's like eleven o'clock. I'm jet lag, and I look and there's like a hundred people out in the park. And they're like square dance, like Texas square dance. I'm like, what the heck is going on? Older, younger, just in the middle of the park. And I we drive down. I see somebody else doing it. Then uh, like a few days later, we go to hoop and like and I have this on film. We're hooping and playing ones, and then on the side you hear like this music, and they're just square dancing. Like mm-hmm. and so like, I'm like, why is everybody square dancing? <laughs> and there was like, oh yeah, we uh, you know it's become a new thing because. You know, we saw people doing it in America, and we just want to learn something new, and that's kind of like what it is now. <laughs> like yeah, they're, right. they're just going through a phase where everybody's square dancing, so they're right. staying active. Yeah. Instead of like us sitting them sitting around uh, and watching TV, some of the TV sucks out there. So like they just go out and do stuff. How it should be. Yeah. How it I, should be. I remember talking to uh, Brandon Walker about right. kind of that market and where they're at yeah. in, in the basketball culture over there, and he's like. The difference between them and us is as soon as we find out we can't make it to the NBA, we stop. Mm-hmm. It's like basketball is this grand, this huge game. It's like and depressing. Then, yeah. And then yeah. as soon as you can't make it to the NBA, you're like, I'm done. I'm yeah. going to go get a full-time job. Out there, you got 40-year-olds like, I'm a mechanic, but on the weekends, I go play basketball. Yeah. And, and, and I the, see and, it. I've and, seen it, too. And they're into it. Yeah. Like, they want to go see the mechanic play against the lawyer. Right. And out here, like, that's pretty rare. You know, you got yeah. your leagues here and there, but for the most part, people give up on their dreams right away. No, Over there, serious. they look, they yeah. see the big picture, and they'll keep playing basketball. And it's still fun to them. Yeah. You know, and so, um, yeah, it goes to that. And then, you know, I didn't, like I said, I didn't know basketball. So when I got back, I was like, if people are starting to take me serious, then I have to take this even more serious. So I just watch film all the time. And where I, where I had questions, I would go call people or email people or talk to old coaches. And then when they were done giving me information, I would seek out like guys like Phil Handy. Phil H- Handy didn't answer. So I would go to watch him before a game. So I'd spend money to go watch, uh, you know, when Cleveland was in town or whoever else that he was, you know, doing training development for. I would watch what he would do with players before games. And then it turned into me just seeing what everybody's doing, like, these are professionals. Guys like JJ Reddick, they're on time and they're doing the same thing every every before every game. Mm-hmm. They're doing the same thing, taking shots in the same spots. And then I saw Kobe would do the same shot because I was a, I'm a huge Lakers fan. So like he would take the same shots in the same spots before every game, and he would stretch the same way, and he would do this the same way because he's becoming a creature of habit. Yep. And so. I was like, all right, let me apply that to guys. Let me apply that that work to – and it started, it started working. So I started seeing more and more kids get scholarships and become pros, and then I started watching more film. I'm like, oh, so this is happening over and over and over. So, like, let me get in contact with this person. So it, it took me – my journey kind of connected me to uh, a Clippers practice. And I would see how – I got a chance to see up close, like, random stuff, like – I saw the process of Blake Griffin becoming a better shooter. Mm-hmm. I got a chance to see Matt Barnes outshoot J.J. Reddick. I'm like, all these dudes can shoot. I watched DeAndre Jordan. Well, that's another story. <laughs> I'll, I'll save that one. But, um, you know, I'm seeing how Doc Rivers is talking to guys at practice, and it was a coach named Coach Severns. That, well, I don't know if he's still with the Clippers but he introduced – he, like, let me, like, see all that type of stuff when they're, the Clippers were at that facility that they were at. I think it's in Santa Monica. And so me seeing how pros work, I'm like, I could be at this level just in my own way. Mm-hmm. I could learn just as much as this stuff. And when I started really taking to that, it was just like, okay, so now it's just about – this is what it is to, to become – to be a pro. And I'm now I'm learning at a high rate, and this is how I can help players just in my own way. 
You know, I never really wanted to be attached to a team. Mm -hmm. You know, I just wanted to be the guy that teams came to in order to, you know, because I, I do film for a lot of players that are in the league. And they come, oh, what are you seeing? Oh, I'm seeing this. Or I'll give you a full report on this. You know, and that's kind of like really how I pay my bills. It's not all, the, all this other stuff. So, yeah. Um, the cool thing about, you know, both of you and I becoming a trainer is it's a matter of hours. Mm -hmm. It's literally, if I want to put in the hours to develop my IQ in this area, I can take myself anywhere. Right. Because NBA players aren't necessarily going like, what other NBA player can I train with? They're yeah. finding out who can help me. Yeah. Whether they played in the NBA, whether they didn't, yeah. it's about your basketball mind. Yeah. Whereas as players, we both put in the work, but because of injuries, because of genetics, we might not have been able to just put our head down and plow through. Yeah. Right? We had limitations, but when we transfer over into the training game, it literally is who's going to work harder. Cause you're not, there's no genetics to it. Yeah. There's no, like I was blessed with basketball IQ. It's just how much am I willing to study? So that's funny. So I always tell people I'm actually not that smart. So like in school, I actually didn't do that. Well, I cheated my way through yeah, school for a lot, here. a big part of it. Same here. I had the ability to learn when I wanted to, mm -hmm. like when I really put my mind to stuff and I started learning that when I started focusing on basketball and learning the game. And so then I would, try different things too. Um, I would try to learn Chinese or this language. I'm like, dude, if I really wanted to apply myself to st stuff, mm -hmm. I would have been a lot better in school or in different areas and I could have upped my IQ because I would have been so focused on just learning and applying this stuff. And so I'm just, what I am is just the master of the obvious. I just look at a lot of basketball. I was just like, well, if you do this, then this is going to happen. Right. And it's not. it doesn't take a genius to point this stuff out. You just need to learn patterns. Yep. And like, okay, when you come off a handoff, these are your options. And if you don't have the ball and somebody's coming off a handoff, this is where you need to be. Right. When the, or Defensively, you need to be on the net. Or just all the little stuff. Like, you can't really stop anybody, but you can push them to spots where they're where they're uh, not good at, mm -hmm. you know? And so, you know, that's what it comes when you're at a professional level. It's so hard to stop dudes, you know, especially one-on-one. Yeah. -on -one, we can't touch them, you yeah. know, so. That's know. what people say, like, NBA doesn't play any defense. I'm like, I would love to see you try to guard. It's in too the NBA. hard. The game is so spread apart. Yeah. The NBA three line is spread apart, and everybody can shoot. Right. So how can you play help side defense? Bro. If somebody gets in the lane, you got so far to go, and now it's just one kick, and now right. you got a three. Right. So it's like sometimes it's better to not play help side defense. Stay glued to my man, and then the fans yell at them like, oh, he's lazy, he's not playing yeah. help side. No, it's literally impossible to stop people in the NBA. Right. And so – I guess something that something that started to click for me too is just realizing that education is actually really cool. And I wish I'd have learned this because I thought it was just more about being funny and getting girls and doing this. And when you get older, what's funny about that, when you're younger, people call you a nerd for being smart. Mm -hmm. When you're when you get older and you have all this information, you know how to play the piano, guitar, you know how to play basketball, you know how to read. <laughs> You know, you know how to speak in, in public. People think you're cool and they think you're yeah. layered and all this yeah. stuff and more girls like you. Yeah. And you have, you're more open to becoming, uh, being with a, a really successful woman that could, yeah. you know, that you think is beautiful, but at the same time, it's more about what's in here. And so, like, it wasn't just for me about women. It was just, like, I now value education and, like, I'm going to have a kid. And I want my kid to understand that early. Like, don't focus on what everybody else is doing. Just focus on being the best version of yourself and so because it, it'll lead you to things that you never really thought were possible like my, my doctor told me that I was going to um, never be able to run and do some of the things that I'm doing right now you'll always have tendonitis because it's chronic and so you know it just came from like watching you uh, buying some programs and just learning like okay testing out on myself like, bro, I got rid of my tendonitis. Yeah. I got rid of it just like, just strengthening, like training, what was it, eccentric? Mm -hmm. Eccentric, concentric? No, eccentric. Yeah. Like, I had to learn yeah. how to stop. I never learned how to stop. I was yeah. always learning how to, to push out and explode out, but I never learned how to stop. So, it, you know, me personally, I don't know all the all the names to everything, but I do know I need to learn how to stop. Yeah. Because I'm watching, you, like, guys like Harden. Right. And, like, Harden is really good at stopping. And so... And I started putting this together. He doesn't get hurt that much. 
he's he's playing every game. He doesn't get hurt that much. Yeah. And like, but he's so good at like either he's going full speed to the basket, shooting jumpers, but he was always good at also stopping at the same time. And I started yeah. noticing that. So I'm like, I'm gonna learn how to stop. So I would apply all these little things that I saw other people do. Yeah. Now in terms of reps and stuff, like all that stuff, names, I'm still working on that. But when I found out how, like, I got when I started building a VMO and opening up my hips, yeah. hip flexors, different things like that, yeah. I was like, oh shoot, like, my knees aren't hurting no more. Yeah. And so I was, I was always making video, or right, I'm gonna do this, I'm gonna stop my tendonitis, but I didn't have enough information. And so when I started, you know, really applying myself and learning from other people, mm -hmm. it wasn't me. Like, I love learning. That's one of my favorite things to do. I love learning from other trainers. I love learning from basketball players. I love learning from kids. Yeah. You know, so uh, there are a few people that told me to build my tibialis anterior and build some of the uh, some of the things in my feet and stretch. Them. And once I started doing that, it was over. I knocked my yeah. tendonitis completely out. And, all, and it made me think, like, bro, all that stuff that people were telling me that I couldn't do or I would never be able to do, it was just they were lacking information. Yeah, they were. That's all they were doing, and they were. T and and to think, I was 18 years old, and they were telling me that. How many other people did they tell? Oh yeah. So now I'm seeing our, how our things. Our whole are generation was told the same thing. Seriously, ibuprofen. I. Oh my gosh. Rest, don't load it, which is the exact opposite of what you should be doing. Right. You should be getting it strong. Right. And, and and they want you to to not strengthen and then go play basketball where. I'm hitting that D cell. I'm going into that eccentric phase with maybe eight times of my body weight on that one leg. Right. Like the, the forces in basketball are insane. And then the more shifty you are, the more forces. What? So your game. Ooh, uh, I would love to measure your game on a force play with like how jerky you are and like your crossovers, your D cells. It's like Kemba Walker. You just see the forces going into his knees with how fast he's stopping. And so you need so much strength in the knees to be able to sustain that style because you could have weak knees and sustain the style of a three and D guy because they're not moving like that. But if you're going to be you, Kyrie Kemba, the strength you got to have in the tendon is unreal. Well, that was what ultimately did a lot for me, like studying those guys. So Kemba tore his ACL or his Achilles? I think he... It wasn't Achilles. I think it was ACL. ACL. Did Kyrie have a knee injury? He's had several. Okay. He's had, he had a full patella tendon rupture, I think. Right. And so I'm seeing that happening and because those are some of my favorite players to watch. And I'm seeing that happen. I'm like, oh, I need to build my legs and my hips and like different things like uh, my hip flexors and I need to. I need. I didn't even have a VMO for a long time. I'm just starting to develop it. Mm -hmm. I, I have to build this stuff if I'm going to keep playing like this, yeah. or else it's going to lead to something really bad. Because running and stopping, like, it's so hard for me to do nowadays. Um, it, it's just recently that it started getting better because I've really been taking like my body seriously, like yeah. in terms of building all this stuff, like. You, you can't build a, a, a building without a strong base. Exactly. You know, a tall building. So, you know, just kind of just focusing on that before I really start touching the basketball court and really thinking about rest. Not the rest that they told me with the doctor. Yeah. Where just like, oh, just don't do anything, don't do anything and then try to get back out there. Yeah. No, bro. Like, you got to – you actually – there's a prehab, rehab, yeah. right? So, we always do stuff. We always rehab when we get hurt. But some of, we should be doing that stuff before to prevent us from exactly. getting hurt in general. So, yep. you know, me seeing how all those guys were, how they're moving when they're 40 and 50, guys who used to be shifty, mm -hmm. I'm like, all right, if I want to keep, it's two things I need to do. If I want to keep moving somewhat like this, I need to strengthen my body and strengthen my legs. And the second thing I need to learn how to do is shoot. Yeah, because <laughs> that's you got to make a game a little easier. Oh my God, it's so much easier when you learn how to shoot. And I didn't yeah. know how to do that really yeah. when I played basketball. So now, you know, applying that, and I'm able to still just play with uh, my younger guys. So I play one on one a lot, right? I don't play one on one with really just anybody consistently. I only play it with the guys I train. If you really watch my videos, it's only with guys I train. I went through the whole stint. Of uh, you know, because we did that pay per view thing. Yeah, yeah. I went through the whole stint. It was just like, 
Because there's a, op- I mean, everybody was kind of gashing it for a while. So I'm just like, okay, we'll do it. I'll play Frigga. We do the whole hype videos and whatever. I'll play against White Iverson, Chris Staples, yeah. all these other guys. Just one last hoorah or whatever. And but but I don't normally do that. Yeah. You know, I know it's mainly just me playing and working. Out, and it, that's how it always started. I was mm-hmm. playing one on one video. If you look at those documentaries, I was just focusing on playing with my guys. It's casual, right? It's not yeah. like you. It was set up. It's like no. you finish. Play, you finish your skill session, and then somebody says something, and you roll the ball out. Let's and you go. Start playing. Yeah, and then I'll, then I'm resting for for two weeks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> but but I don't have to do that now. Yeah, I don't have to do that now. How um, old are you now? Two, 32. I'm I 32. always have to think about that. I know. So you're 32. I'm 31. Mm-hmm. My body feels better than ever. Like right now, right now, right now. I'm jumping off the trampoline and doing depth jumps, like stuff that I never thought my knees could handle. And it's because I learned how to train. Imagine if we had that from the start. Man. And so basketball is set up backwards. We get them into playing, which look, I love getting kids experience in basketball. I love it. But you start them playing and then we start taking the body stuff serious later on in high school or in college. You should be starting off from day one. It should be before you even start playing basketball, you know how to do a body weight squat, right? You know how to decelerate because we don't want to have somebody who can create energy, who can go one way and not stop that. Because then when you go do stop that, it's going straight to the knees. You're not absorbing it in the right areas. Then basketball works against us because in AAU, we play every weekend. You play four games a weekend. That's what killed me. Yeah. Yeah. Our generation is probably the first that really played every weekend. Yeah. Right? Like the generation before us, it was like you played here and there, travel Mm -hmm. ball. But with us, it was like every weekend you're going to go play four games. And you look at these forces on the body, multiplied by four games, multiplied by every weekend, Crazy. every summer. Yeah. Unreal. It racks up the and you fact that your any career. of us survive, you know, it past 30. <laughs> yeah. The fact that we're yeah. playing right now is a miracle. Yeah. And it's really just because we figured out how to actually take care of our bodies. Right. So I don't I don't know as much as you, but in turn when it comes to that type of stuff, but I'll piggyback off of what you're saying. So I told you I was going to connect this. So my dad was a white sock, right? So I got a lot of speed and athleticism. I saw my dad dunk at 43 years old or 45. Wow. He was older and, and he looked it too. And so I just saw him. He went up in the driveway off stride and dunked the basketball. And the the court was like a little bit high. We, it was funny. We're taking it down today at my at my at the house that I grew up at. But I saw him do that off stride. And so I realized when I when I was in high school, that I never really worked for a windmill. I just could do it. Mm-hmm. And it slowly but surely it started wearing down and I couldn't, I needed to warm up. I needed to do this before I ended up jumping or I needed to play a full game before I before I caught, threw it off the backboard. Yeah. And that started to go down and down and down until it was just like, now it's just like, okay, just shoot the basketball. <laughs> yeah. But I didn't work on my legs. Mm-hmm. I had to think about, what was I doing? Nothing. I just got it from my dad. And I was active and I was playing basketball and I was building some of the muscles uh, concentrically, mm-hmm. but not eccentrically. Right. And I didn't even know to, I didn't even know the difference between the two. Yeah. So eccentric is is stopping, right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, lowering stop. Yeah, yeah, so still learning. So when I got older, more recently. Then I start training that, and now I'm feeling like I'm getting closer back to. And Calvin can tell you, like sometimes I'm just running workouts, and then I play. Mm-hmm. Like I don't even warm up. I, yeah. I'll just start playing with the guys, which yeah. you should be warm. But like I can do that. It's now. a good sign. Yeah, it's a good sign. You know your body's in a good resting state when you can just go maximal right away. Right. I always tell people that. Like I still advise that you warm up. Oh yeah, for sure. But if it really takes you 15 minutes to warm up, your body's not in a good resting state. Right. So that's what, like, I'll be running a session and then I want to challenge somebody on a sprint. So I'll just hop in and sprint and I'll hang with them. And it's like no warm up. And that's when you know your body's doing really well. Yeah. So that that was me, though. I didn't have any any information on that type of stuff. It was just my dad, um, you know, and that's kind of what led to the tendonitis because I had no muscles in my quads. My calves were strong. Um I didn't have like any hip. Like I look back at the pictures and you could tell like my hips were just weak. You could just yeah. look at it and tell. Um, and so that wear and tear, I don't even want to say wear and tear, jumping up and landing or stopping from a snatch or anything, it was all going to my knees. Yeah. 
and and slowly that started to wear me down and you know by the time I got to college I really didn't have anything left in the tank and that's what led to um I went through I went through like uh depression and I didn't know I was going through it. Mm-hmm. I went through uh panic attacks and that was the that was the start of it. Just being frustrated from not being able to do the things that I knew that I could do. Yep. So this is a random story. So I always had a thing against Dino Stragonis. I was always pissed at him for a long time. I met him and I got over it a long time, long time ago. But when I was in uh, going to the eleventh grade, I was the best that I had been ever. And so I was hitting shots. I was diming people. I didn't understand basketball, but I was locking my man up. I didn't know nothing about help defense, but my game stood out. So I went to Pangos killing everybody right killing and so this was the beginning of the tendonitis but it was like to the point where I could still ball out right and so I was killing pangos and I was seeing you know DeMar DeRozan all these other guys and I was and I didn't even know who they were because I felt like I was the best there mm-hmm. and so I, I love telling the story so it comes down to the last day when you go to Pangos, you know that you're playing good because coaches start lining up or sitting down at your, to watch your game. Yeah. That was me because I was going for like 17 and 10 and stuff like that. And so uh, <laughs> shout out to Coach Lynch. So it was came the last day that we were supposed to uh, – it was like top 30, top 60, top 90. Everybody there is like, dude, you top 30. You're going to make it. So I'm like, I didn't even know. Like, I was just, I just felt like I was killing. I'm gonna make something. They put the papers on the walls, three papers, and you see all these kids lined up. So I go to the top 30, look down the list. Brandon Jennings. I didn't even know. Anyway, so I'm, I didn't make the top 30. So I see top 60. Actually, it was Ty Lawson, Brandon Jennings, was some other Demar Derozan. It was some other players that I just specifically remember seeing their names. I go to top 60. Okay, there's no Devin up there, so <laughs> surely I'm on the top 90, right? Okay, I'm not on any of the lists. Like, there has to be some misunderstanding because I was killing this kid. Yeah. It's on the top 60. Killed him. I had 22 on you. And and we, we played, what, 15 minutes? I was killing this kid. I don't even want to say his name because a lot of people from L.A. don't know him. But my coach was hot. He was walking around the court. What Dino's? He, 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 that's how he talks. Dino, what's what's going on, my guy? He's not on this list. Come to find out, you know, and, and rightfully so. Looking at hindsight, those guys made the NBA, yeah. but like he didn't even play. Brandon Jennings didn't even play. Yeah, he just showed up the last day, and, and just being that he had a had a name, you know, he's on the list. Yeah, because he earned that. He, actually, he was really good. He was two grades younger than me, and I, I get it. Brandon Jennings was nice. Yeah, he was pretty good. But at that point, I was older. I was I was eleven grade. He was a ninth grader. Yeah, and you know I, I'm from Gardena too. Yeah, you know I don't know if you have to. I used to see him at Raleigh Park, but um, I was pretty nice. Now, needless to say, who ended up being a little bit better, <laughs> you know? But but at that time, I'm, I'm like Hooper's mindset, whoop de whoop, right? Yeah. And so uh, how it went, he just replaced me. Yeah. And he didn't put me on any other list. And I I held something against – and then from that point, my point about saying all this, my point uh, is that I got hurt from that point on and I wasn't able to play to my highest level after that. Mm-hmm. And so, like, that was the beginning of de- of depression and anxiety and, you know, not being – because not being able to do what you know that you can do is really, really frustrating. And I know all the hoopers know what I'm talking about. If you've ever been injured – and you, even if you just twisted your ankle, you know, like you've been at that point. It's like, dang, like I know I can get up and dunk, or I could have got on a fast break and did this, or I could have dropped thirty, but I couldn't because of this. Yep. You know, and but so I, I would argue that you needed that pain and that struggle to be as successful as you are today. I, I would argue the same you thing. Got to go through yeah. something. That and that was my thing. Same thing. The injuries, depression. A couple years down, it's like, man, I don't know what I'm going to do. It's that pain that when you overcome it, that's what makes you successful. Because how many people do you know who went and played at a high level? Maybe they play overseas. They know a lot about the game. They're good themselves. And then they get into training and they don't necessarily take off. Right? It's like, why? You have the accolades. You have the resume. You should be taking off. Maybe it's because everything went perfect. 
And yeah. they never had that like real struggle. I'm so happy to be training and not in the NBA. Yeah. You know, there are some guys that are not in the NBA right now that people know me before they know them, which yeah. is really weird to think about. And it's not me being boastful. It's no, just it's that I'm able to impact the game at a higher level because I would have been good. I could have been good. And say if I did happen to make the NBA, right, I'm still not Kyrie. I don't think that I would have got to that point personally. Um, but even still, I wouldn't have been able to have an impact on kids. Like, I, I know you go through this. Um, I'm, I'm at the NBA Combine. John Collins comes up to me. He's like, yo, like, your videos kept me motivated. It's the reason why I started working hard yeah. today, you know? And I'm running to so many players that tell me that. And it's like, I wouldn't have had this impact. But what did I miss out on, though? So, first of all, there's plenty of NBA guys that lose their money and, they're, you know, they're figuring out right now. But mm -hmm. on top of that, I have my own shoe. I have a clothing brand. More people, like, there's, like, millions of people who know about me and just in general. I've been on TV. I, I, I still play basketball. And that, like, you know, them seeing my gear, like, they're going to buy the clothing. So I'm still kind of playing basketball for a little. I went to China. And made more money than I ever made in my life just playing basketball. Like, yeah. they were just one time a week. Right. So, I'm still pl uh, getting paid to play just in my own way. Yeah. So, like, I've reached my NBA. And most importantly, you don't have to answer to anybody. No. That's you, you great. You don't have five bosses like an NBA player has. So, like... Bro, tonight, if I want to go in my freezer and get, like, a, a jar of peanut butter and just eat the whole thing or mix it with some ice, I can do that. Right. Totally fine. If I just want to just wake up tomorrow morning and just sit on my couch and, and spam, like, any show that I want or, or all our animes that we watch, I can just do that if right. I want. Right. You know? Or, and then I can just go work out. But I love, and I know you do too, I love what I do. Yeah. You know? And so it's so much fun to be able to love what you do because it makes you want to do it more. It makes you want to even study it more. Mm -hmm. And it makes you excited to watch the game. I love, dude, I love watching basketball yeah. so much that sometimes I get on Twitter and talk as a fan. Yeah. And I don't care what anybody thinks. Right. You know why? Because this is it's my Twitter. Yeah. As long as I don't get canceled by saying something crazy, like too <laughs> crazy, but like I, I just can do what I want and and still motivate people being who I am. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, I've inspired a lot. I got a chance to to do a, a grant a wish for the Make a Wish Foundation. Yeah, you know, and so all that was because I didn't make it to the NBA, mm -hmm. and I did things my own way. It's so crazy how that works out because we all have the same goal. Obviously, it's make it to the NBA. There's no backup. There's nothing no. I'm going to the NBA. And then it doesn't work out, but then you end up in a better path. And that's what's crazy is like, as long as you stay driven, you stay connected to the passion, you're probably going to end up somewhere where you were meant to be, right? right? Like we were meant to do this and we right. were meant to inspire and change thousands of lives. Um, it, sometimes I have NBA players that, you know, come train with me and they're like, yo, can I switch you? Like, yeah. You go to the NBA and I want to be here training yeah. people. Um, so yeah, it's, it's pretty crazy. It's, it's the power of pivoting. You know, you have your, you have your goal and you want to go get that, but at some point everything starts adding, maybe it's all the injuries, maybe whatever it is for me, it was multiple injuries in a row, broken bone after broken bone. And you got to figure out like, how do I pivot? How do I still become successful, still do what I love, but just do it in a different way? Yeah. And so, and so, um, you know, everything that, I, I met my dad. My, my dad and I, we, we bond because of basketball. My wife, I met her because I got a scholarship because of basketball. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many things that basketball has led me to, and I'm so thankful that it's given me opportunity. Like, like Calvin, like, where have we went? Where have we traveled to? You know, have we traveled out the country? Chicago, Canada. We, we went to Canada, went to Chicago. We, we, I've gotten a chance to just allow some of my friends yeah. to travel with me yep. and like go and, and it, sometimes it didn't even become about basketball it's just like 
oh, this food is good and or this like this moment was hilarious. Like we have so many like fun moments like with the guys that I travel with. And for me, that's what it's become about. It's just yeah. about the journey. So now, you know, you always heard about this. It's not about the destination. It's about the journey. Yeah. And so now I'm I'm starting to pick up on that. Yeah. And so even when things, like, say, if the, even if chips get low, I never really, like, panic anymore because I know that I can lock in or that it's something that's just around the corner. Like, where every, like every door that's closed – I pivot to a, n- a new door that's open. Yeah, you know, and so well, you have to you have to go through it to actually understand that because that's a quote that we all throw around. Is like it's not about the money; it's about the passion. Right? Everybody throws that around, right. but you don't really feel it until you've been through that. Yeah. And let me ask you this: on your best days, let's say you a week of really great sales, that next week are you really more happy? Right. For me, I'm not more happy. No. So it's like, I'm trying so hard to do this and then the money comes in and that doesn't make me more happy. What actually makes me happy is doing the work, is staying up oh, two yeah. nights in a row coming out with the program. It really is the process. And, and it's just a quote thrown around until you fully experience that and you realize, oh shoot, the the the, the end, the des- destination really doesn't matter. You know, I, I'm really just an a-hole. Like a lot of people don't know this, but I, I didn't know that I was an emotional guy until I, I got into my work. And so, like, I'd be up editing, and I, like, you know, I, I like, do narration and all that stuff. And I start tearing up because I really like this part. And it's, like, tears of joy. Like, I didn't know that when I was a kid that this type of stuff would happen. It's just because I'm so passionate about what I do. And those moments, even over when I actually put the video out, those moments are what I live for because just in the in the house by yourself, dark room, computer on, music blasting, editing, and you putting this art together. And it's just like, yo, this is so dope, right? And so I get the most satisfaction. You know, you're you're kind of like me. You could just be fine with just being by or just chilling. For sure. Yeah. And just being like your own type of guy. You don't have to go out on club. No. You don't have to do this, drink smoke. Like you could just be who you are in a house by yourself. Put and you're me in good a room, with it. lock the door, give right. me some books, give me some basketball to watch. Yeah. Like I like alone time to create and think of ideas. Yeah. I actually don't like a lot of noise and, right. and yeah, I mean I can be social. Yeah. But majority of the time I'm gonna be I'm gonna be by myself. And creating. so in Vegas, I noticed that right off top about you. Like you're just like whereas these guys are are like a little bit louder. Like Johnny, he's like, you know, more outgoing and um, DJ's kind of like a mix of both. Like, you don't know, have that whole New Jersey accent and all that <laughs> stuff. Jordan's just full of energy. Like, yeah. but you, you're just like almost like a surfer. Yeah. Like, you know, just like, <laughs> yeah. just so chill. That's like, a good way to yeah, you're just, yeah. you just chill. And so when I saw that, I'm like, okay, that's like, I can vibe with that. And, and that's kind of how I am. So when I saw how you were putting stuff together and I saw how many videos you're putting out and podcasts and I know how much this guy's working. So then I, then I know like, Oh, he, the only way for you to really do this is you have to be in the lab working on it. You have to, you have to be grinding. So I always connected with that. And so, um, for me, you know, those, those times where I'm feeling that, uh, I really, those were the best moments of my my whole journey, this whole ten thousand hours thing. When I was by myself putting in work, yeah. when I was sneaking into uh, buildings, um, trying to like really work hard and, and just get in the studio. It was a studio a lot just like that, or a little booth just like that yep. that I would go into. And I was staying all night. I have pizza and, and water, a big cup to pee in because yeah. I couldn't go outside because oh, the, yeah. the alarm would go off. Damn. So like I was literally doing, I was sneaking into my, my school yeah. and learning how to edit up on YouTube, this and that, how to how to do this, how to do this cut, how to do this transition. I had no clue what I was doing. I, a lot of it was self taught, and so those moments. Where you get away with that mm. when I'm breaking into gyms mm. and like, you know, I'm 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 finding a kid that has a key and he's like sneaking me in here all that time. Those are the moments like where you where you feel like, dang, like nobody else is doing this. We up at one, we just finished. This is one a.m., two a.m., and we just finished a hard three hour workout. Yeah, you know, opposed to not getting any rest, but you know, which which is necessary. I love the fact. That we were doing stuff when nobody else was doing it, yep. but we weren't thinking about that. It was just that 
we were so locked in uh, just what we were doing. And now when I call Kyle, when I call Maddie or whoever else, the guy, all, I trained so many guys during that time. But when I call those guys, we have all these stories to uh, to talk about. Mm-hmm. You know, the the two Asian kids, one of the Asian kids, the older brother, Kyle, he has, uh, he's going to have a son. Like, uh, he might have had it, like, last few days. Or, no, he hasn't had it because he would have called me. But he's going to have one in a few days. Then uh, Kristen. Uh, a lot of people don't I don't know if I well I might as well say it now he's guaranteed to be a father I'm guaranteed to be a father and it's all happening at the same time Yeah. and so like even when we call we all have all these things that we can just go back and talk about right. uh, all those times we were grinding and the game winners and you know Tommy set a school record that still exists to this day mm-hmm. you know uh, there, there's one of the best things I'm good at is, is teaching people how to shoot. I, I talked about that earlier yeah. there's a kid named James I remember we changed his jumper. He ran off 11 threes back-to-back after we changed his jump, And in two games back-to-back, the next day after the next day, after me changed his jumper. And we still talk about this. It's so, it's so cool. And now I have these connections with these guys that will last forever. Right. And it all comes from just having that, building that story, but not even trying to think of that story, just being stuck in the moment. Yeah, right? Sure. And so that's like my favorite thing. But something, and this is kind of off topic, and I, I, I always wanted to ask, what do you think about the state of where basketball is right now, the culture, this, that, and that? I always wanted to ask you that in particular. Yeah, yeah. So what you just described is, I think, what's missing. Yeah. The 1 a.m., I'm sneaking into the gym, the, yeah. I'm at the park. You know, I, I'm from a, a small town, a, a mountain town. People don't know that it snows in Arizona, but it does in Flagstaff. And to play, I got to go shovel the driveway. Yeah. It's those moments. Though That's what builds your character. Yeah. That's what builds your toughness. And I think that's what's missing is right now, if a kid's going to go hoop, they got to have a nice gym. That gym's got to have a nice floor. They're not going to go play outside, which I think quarantine was good for because it got people back out on the streets a little mm-hmm. bit playing outside. But I think that's what's missing because let, let's be honest, people are way more skilled now. Like, oh, for sure. My, my nephew, he's doing moves that I didn't have until I was a freshman in high yeah. school. You know, like, like these kids are way more skilled. They're more athletic. Um it, it, I, I think basketball is getting better as any industry should evolve. Every industry should get better every 10 years. Basketball is no different. Uh, but the mentality, I think with our generation, that's where it really peaked. And now people are getting a little bit softer. I think it's just because they're missing those moments, the sneaking into the gym and the playing outside. There's a there's a bunch of things that I, I love talking about this stuff, and I never care what anybody thinks about what I say about it. But so – Back in the old days, which is funny for me to say, well, I'm, I am starting to get older, both of us, but mm-hmm. when Magic was playing and Larry Bird was playing, I don't think that they played on all the same AAU teams. Mm-hmm. You know, so, like, when they met each other, there was cert- a certain level of testosterone that were raised and everybody's ready to go at each other because they've been hearing about this person that's good on the other side or wherever, right? Mm-hmm. Um, and so now with social media, it's allowed everybody to be a lot closer and, and really like, okay, I respected people after we played. I didn't respect people before we played. Yeah. You have to earn that. And so that was like how I was raised to be like, just kind of crazy like that. And so with kids nowadays, they're, you're almost seeing kids get, uh, fear in them before they play a certain guy that's ranked because they're watching their highlights and they're following them and doing yeah, this. Like yeah. me personally, I, I couldn't even process. And I probably would have been a part of the same journey if I was born in this, but I wasn't yeah. though. Yeah. I wasn't born in, in the two thousands. I, I was born in the, in the, uh, the 1900s, which is, which sounds yeah, right. crazy. Kids are going to be making fun of, you know, be fun of me uh, with my son. He's like, yeah, your dad was born in the 1900s, but yeah, in the eighties, <laughs> bro. And so for me, like I see this and I see how things have become more buddy, buddy. And I'm from the street ball era. So, Guys like Pooh, my bad. Guys like Pooh, Bobby Brown, Trevor Reza, whoever, Hassan Adams, um, Russell Westbrook, uh, there's so Gay Pruitt, Brandon Jennings, all these guys I can name from LA. I would just see them going from park to park to park to park to park. Yeah. So if this closed down, 24 o'clock, rush out, uh, we're going to rush park, or we're going to rally, or we're going here, and they'll hoop. And, and we, there was this thing called late night sports, right? And so 
there were three courts. One, two, three. All the good players would end up on one because they'd make their way up there or they would start there. Now, I would have to – I was younger, so I would have to go from court three, and if I win, I go to court two, and if I lose, I go back to court three. But every now and then I make my way up to court one and I would play against these monsters like they were – they were all going to end up being NBA players. And so, like, from that was my tournament. It wasn't even, like, AAU. It was just trying to get to that first court yeah. so I could hoop. And, and late night was sick because it was at night. And it would start at, what, 10 o'clock and go to whatever time. And so there was a certain thing. And they started so they can get kids off the street, stop doing drugs, start, you know, start hooping. And so I always respected that. So I would go up there and, you know, just try to make it to that first court. And I love telling the story. Bobby Brown, who played for the Houston Rock, Sacramento King, whoever. He's nice, yeah. He's the first person to ever cross me. Like left to right hard, and I was out of there, bro. Hit the jumper, and he he didn't even really acknowledge me. He didn't talk no trash. He just kept going back down the other way. And so for me, like you know, that was I always wanted to just kill those guys, right? Yeah. Um, and, and just like be competitive, and yeah. that was my generation, just being competitive, just going to hoop, and you know, just the the rivalries that you were building over time. And I didn't really like, I didn't really conversate with people like that. Yeah, I, I wasn't built. It's not that I was trying to be a mean guy. It's just that I was so competitive. I learned to calm down a little bit when I got older. But, you know, I'm seeing how things are becoming more uh, nice. Yeah. And, and, and the culture of basketball where it's just like one-on-one street ball, you're going to get hand checked, you're going to get dunked on, talking trash. It's not even just about the trash talk. It's just about the grittiness of even just going outdoors and playing basketball in the first place. 100%. And, and piggyback on what you were saying, it was nice to see people get back outdoors and this and that. I was forced over quarantine to train kids outside. Everybody was like, why are you not in the gym? I'm like, fool, we quarantine. Right. We're, we're not supposed to be technically in the gym right now. So I was forced. And Calvin was with me like we're, you know, hooping outside every morning, 630. You know, and it, and for me, I noticed with the kids, like mentally, it did something for them to wake up and focus on going outside. Me, not me. A lot of kids don't even think to go outside. Yeah. They say, if it's not a gym, I'm not working out. And I understand a little bit of it in terms of, you know, the impact that you take on the ground. But what I learned through those kids is if I build them up, to be strong enough, that cement didn't hurt them. Yeah. And we were able to handle that load. You which, adapt. The yeah. body will adapt. I thought that was so sick. And I learned, really learned that through quarantine. I had no problem going outside and working out. And then I started doing it. I'm like, oh, I'm not hurt. Yeah. Because I was working out with them. Yeah. And so, uh, you know, the grittiness and all that type of stuff, I love the skill level nowadays. But I don't love kids' approach. Sometimes it just seems more about swag and looking For cool. Sure. You know, and I tell people that I hate the basketball swag nowadays because I always hated Hooper swag. I used to be a part of it, but now I hate it looking back because it's not, it's more about just like, you know, seeming like you're cooler than Being what you are, so not cool. talking. Yeah. And, and, and not be, and what I started noticing about a lot of guys is that they just didn't know how to present themselves mm -hmm. and how to talk. Yeah. And I learned that for myself because I had to take a communications class in school. And it, you were required to go up and give a speech about whatever. Yes. And when I started doing it, I was like, dang, I'm stuttering over words. Like, how I'm talking right. when I couldn't do it. Bro, every Hooper needs to take, uh, like, a public speaking class. Yes, that's absolutely. that's when I turn the corner is because yeah. now I'm up in front of the whole class and I got to come up with some speech. And then I realize how bad I am. Yep. Because as a Hooper, the better you are, the less you have to talk. Because right. you're not going to start conversations. In right. fact, you think that that's not cool. You walk in the gym, you want everybody to come to you. You somebody asks you a question, you give them a one word answer. I hate it. I yeah. can't stand it. And that's how it is today. But even when we are coming up, the better the hooper, the less you have to talk. Right. And then eventually you get hit in the face, and you're in the real world, and you're like, oh, my my game doesn't matter anymore. Yep. My the way that I communicate is all that matters. Yep. And then you figure it out. But man, the earlier you can get that, the better. Go look back at Magic Johnson and, and Michael Jordan and some of those guys early on in their career when they were speaking in post-game uh, interviews or whatever, mm -hmm. and then now look at, you know, where they got when they got older. Yeah. You know, and I always love something about Kobe. He spoke two different – or a few different languages. Yeah. And and I and he made me think that it was cool to be 
um, I was so stupid as a high schooler, bro. I'm like, I'm taking Spanish class, cheating my way through it. And I told my mom, I never forget. And it's just like, because I was so stupid. I was just stuck in a black neighborhood. I'm like, why Why do we need to, to learn Spanish? They need to learn English. <laughs> and instead of just like being smart and learning multiple languages. Yeah. And when I got older, I realized how much of an idiot I was for ever uttering those words. But, mm -hmm. you know. When you get a guy in an interview that doesn't isn't comfortable in front of cameras, um, they always say, "Well," and I don't have a problem with this because I'm a guy fearing person. But it's like I just want to thank God and this and that, and you know this and that. And I even be looking at the camera, looking at the person interviewing. It's just you know, yeah. this and that, and they don't know how to like. They give one word answers, um, or just try this. And Calvin, you as my witness, you could put your camera in front of a kid. Sometimes don't even say anything. And they go, oh, yeah, we out here. Or oh, they'll do this. Like, and what is this? Yeah. What, what does it mean? Fact. Like, everybody's, like, throwing up games. This, right. I, I can tell you what this means when I was growing up. This is, a game. this is how you get shot. Right. So, like, this people was doing this. And I'm like, what, why are kids doing it? Yeah. We're, we're, everybody knows you're outside. And sometimes you're saying we out here and you're inside. Like, what are you talking about? You know, it's because they don't know what to say. That's their yeah. go-to instead of – and so – what I start realizing is when kids get older, especially if they're good at basketball, so much helps to be able to speak in front of a camera yep. because now you become marketable. Yeah. Now when you go on those commercials, you're getting more commercial and you're able to like speak those lines. Like I love Blake Griffin for this reason. When he gets on a podcast or he gets on anything, he could talk and he's mm -hmm. funny, yeah. well-spoken. J.J. Reddick, well-spoken, yep. very knowledgeable. And so you want to listen to those guys. Right. There's some guys I don't want to listen to. No. You know, because they're, they're, you know, can't, can't you understand what they're mumbling and stuff? Right. Like, no, like. The most impressive is LeBron because yes. he was doing it from a young age. You could tell that he had the media Off training. top. You could tell that he's been studying how people talk. Off top. Because he's coming into the league speaking in full sentences and right. you wanted to hear him talk you want to hear what lebron had everybody to knew he was going to be good so whoever his team was or maybe he noticed it it was like i gotta i gotta know how to do this i gotta be prepared when people were speaking in front of me and he doesn't slip that often either yeah you know there was one where everybody knocked him and was like well you know y'all gotta go back and live in reality I, i'm gonna go sit in my mansion and yeah. you know what I'm saying? Yeah. he doesn't slip that often no it's just more like very well presented um I promise school, you know, he comes off as super intelligent. He has a super smart team yeah. that are doing big things. Um, not to make this a whole, like, racial thing, but I love, like, how he empowers black people. Yeah. And I went to uh, Undisputed or what uh, was it Undisputed? It was something. What was this thing called? Undefeated? Whatever. Yeah. He has, like, a company, and I went to, like, they, they asked me to come in and just uh, they wanted to do some meeting with me. And it was like going to Wakanda. Mm -hmm. and the, the sliding glass doors open it was like all these black people not just all black but it was like everybody was very well presented very well trimmed yeah. and for me when I saw how LeBron LeBron and his team put this together mm -hmm. it made me really want to go talk so I trade Barry so the Barry he's just like you know you put a camera in front of him he'll just say two words you ask him a question you know how you want people to like really like yeah we had a tough day it was you know we worked on this and I felt a little bit tired but you know I'm I'm hanging it. He just like, you know, it was a good workout. Yeah. And I'm like, Barry, you got to learn how to talk. He doesn't understand that when he learns how to do that, it's going to make him a better communicator on the court. Yeah. It's going to make him a better communicator in the real world. When he plays basketball and he needs to get something across that he knows that can happen, some people don't, aren't able to get that across to people. Right. I learned that you need to be able to communicate effectively when you're running a business because I own a business now. And so there are some people that – they break when you talk to them a certain way. And there are some people that respond a certain way when you talk to them a different way. Mm -hmm. And so, like, I – and part of that comes from me just knowing people. And how do you know people? How do you get to know people? You got to talk to them. Right. You got you to gotta find out some of the things they like, some of the things that work. Like, me and Calvin, we we relate because we we love anime. So, like, mm -hmm. automatic boom, it clicks. Right. You know, and, and some other people, like, they love – okay, we click. Right. Some people like this artist or this and that. But if you never really talk to them – and you don't come off off top as a person that can speak and present them themselves well, then people write you off. Mm -hmm. And especially like and I and I for all the black athletes and not even just black athletes, just athletes in general, people will write you off. 
if you can't speak and all he just a he's just another hooper. Right. Everybody understands this. Like a lot of athletes come from uh, you know, black areas where basketball and football. That doesn't mean the best athletes always come from those areas because Steph Curry wasn't from the hood. But, you know, they they come from areas and, and people always write also oh, so they're gonna play sports when they get older. But like, is there another layer to you? Mm -hmm. Do you know how to speak? Do you know how to play an instrument? Can you write an essay? Yeah. Value yourself because now, say if there are there are guys that came out with, and I mean, because there are guys that came out with um like sick blogs, and I and I lock in and read our sick podcasts. And had they not been able to be like some sort of intelligent, they would have never been able to do that and bring in a whole different medium of revenue. Mm -hmm. And so, and I just think it's so cool that I think that more people need to start valuing that. So I do respect something, some things out of this generation because there are kids that try to do that. Yeah. So, and, and I think there are kids that can do more of that, but they don't think it's cool. Because it's of so this cool, culture, bro. it's like if I say too many words, that's not cool. Right. So even if they do have the ability, they hold back right. because it's not the standard. So I'd like to see that kind of become the standard. Me too. Um, and they don't understand that you're going to make twice as much money oh my if, if you could present yourself like that. You know, I, I love telling people the story because and some people, you know, when you're a kid, sometimes you just, some people get it. And we'll, we'll listen and then learn. Yeah. Some people have to go through this experience. So I always tell kids, like, yo, like, shout out to James, man. So James, I came to him in, like, the 10th grade. I said, you need to learn Chinese. You have to learn Chinese. He didn't really take me serious. And I was on an app called Fluence, and I was learning a lot. I only stopped doing Chinese because I stopped going out there as much. Um, mainly because of the pandemic. So when you stop doing it, you lose it. Yeah. James never listened to me throughout college or throughout high school. Stopped playing after college, right? And James contacted me one day. I think it was during quarantine. He was like, "All right, I'm I'm getting I'm gonna get serious and I'm gonna learn Chinese." And James was a super hard worker, right? James Chun, and he ended up. Over quarantine, I remember he hit me up one month later after he said that, like, dude, like, sick. I ordered Chinese food and, and spoke only Chinese. I saw him, like, seven months after that. He came to the house fluent. Yeah. It's so amazing what you could do when you apply yourself to something. And, and I'm just like, dude, Jay, that is going to open up so many doors for you. He has all these goals, how he wants to go model out in China yeah. um, and all this stuff. But Humans are so much, we're, we're capable of so much more than we think. Mm -hmm. You're comparing yourself to other people around you, but sometimes when you set that standard higher and you're like, let me learn five languages, you could. You could. I'm a hypocrite because I'm not doing that. I know, me too. You could, and I know that uh, I have that ability to do that. Yeah. And the cool thing about doing stuff like that, learning another language you're not just learning that language. It opens up your brain. It, so I think about it like fixing bugs. It's like you download you know, your new software and you fix bugs on your phone. Yeah. If you go study Chinese or whatever language, you're fixing bugs. And so your brain just thinks faster. You think better because you're opening up that center of your brain. All of a sudden, you're speaking English better because you remember words that you learned in 11th grade that you totally forgot about. I missed out on I missed out on a hundred I believe it was a hundred thousand uh, dollars because I was going to go train a team in a different country but the but the uh, requirement that is that I knew a mediocre level of of Spanish mm -hmm. and I couldn't do it yeah and I and I, I thought back to all my Spanish classes and this is this was before I went to China for the first time so like keep in mind I was broke right. so like my first people don't realize this when I, my first Three or four videos of $10,000 all had copyrighted music. So no matter how many views they had, I didn't make anything off yeah. of it. And so even when you make a channel, especially nowadays, you have to have a certain level of minutes, amount of minutes or views or whatever before you can get your channel monetized. I didn't have my channel monetized for a long time, so I didn't make a penny. Right. So, you know, when, when I missed all that money, I was just like, dang, like that was a mistake that I could have fixed early on if I would have just been more about Okay, let me 
hear what people are saying. My mom was always telling me, learn a different language. If I would have just listened, I'd have been right. fine. I'd have, I'd have had a hundred thousand dollars right there. I probably blew it. I, I probably would have blew it at that point because yeah. I didn't know how to manage money, but it still would have been nice to have it. Right. You know? Right. hundred percent. Okay. So now I like to do a speed round at the end. So I'm just throwing random questions at you. Top five handles of all time. Kyrie. Of course. Jamal Crawford. Of course. Um, Rod Strickland is mm, up there, mm. which is a random one. Um, I, honestly, you know, I'm, I'm leaning more towards Steph nowadays. Yeah. People sleep because people are focused on how he shoots. They nah, forget about how crazy his handles are. And his finishing. Bro, yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. But if, if you really right look there, at him. He's right there behind Kyrie in right. finishing and in handles. Right. And so, like, his control over the basketball is really incredible. I named four. Yeah. Uh, Dang. I know I'm going to slip up on this, but... You know the YouTube comments are gonna get you. Yeah, you didn't put so and so. I can't do it. I'm I'm like so stuck right now. But was it Kyrie, Jamal, Steph? Who else did I say? Uh, Rod Strickland. Let's just go with Tim Hardaway. Tim Hardaway. Yeah, yeah. I'm stuck. I mean, he invented a whole crossover. Yeah, I'm stuck still right now. It's, uh, it's a lot of people. Though. Yeah, so I'm gonna go Kyrie, and we I think we both agree he's the best of all yeah. time, hands down, not yeah. close. Okay, uh, Steph, um, Jamal Crawford. Mm-hmm. Allen Iverson. Okay, he's up there. Yeah, I ain't. But I about don't that. know if it's as much. Yeah, more moves. Hand. Yeah, I don't know if it's as much his handle or just his agility. No, I didn't he think. So he, fast. I didn't think his handles were that incredible. Yeah, I thought his moves, his movement, like his left and right crossover and him snatching back were really good. Right, and so like his reaction to, but it was his speed. So when yeah. he lost his speed, his handles didn't seem as great to me. Right. And I was my guy too. But. So it, he might not be in the handles category. He's in the But I, I'm okay category. with somebody puts him up there a little yeah, bit. Yeah, like, for sure. To me, he's not. Um, Jason Williams. Jason Williams Oh, shoot. Handles. That was another one. Yeah. I'd have probably put him before Tim Hardaway. Yeah. yeah. Jason Williams I, Dang, I didn't think about it. That was a good one. Yeah. White chocolate. Um, I was one of my favorite players too. Yeah, he was cold. His passing too. Yeah, he would throw the craziest passes. Yeah, some games he'd have he'd like just throw it. It'd into be the too crowd. much. Like, yeah. it'd be too much. It'd be but too much. You still watch. You know who way. he reminds me of sometimes with those passes, and he was he's not as flashy, but Steph. Steph will just throw in the middle of a championship behind the back straight out of bounds. <laughs> right, and he 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 gets one a game where he does something yeah. like that, even if he's going for forty, out of bounds. Right, you know, so shows his confidence. Yeah, though. seriously. Okay. Uh, your handles are as good as blank. Name an NBA player who's right on your level as far as handles. Um, it's a tough one. Kemba. Ooh, I was gonna say Kemba for you. Yeah, I was gonna say because he. I like how he moves, and when I'm at my best, like that's more about Kemba, how I move. It, Kemba's a lot like uh, Iverson yeah. in the fact that his change of direction is crazy. Right. I always say Kemba has the best agility of all time in basketball. Right. In terms of start stop. Yeah. Um, but he does have the handle too. So so Kimba, he shifts more. There's difference shifts, between yeah. mixing and shifting. So yeah. Kyrie, sometimes he doesn't shift people. He's just going through you. Yeah. Kimba, the separation left from like defender go left, he goes right. That's what I love. So like everybody knows Trevor Dunbar. If you ever don't know who he is, look him up. Yeah. Um, but that's what we were about. We didn't want you to touch us. Yeah. You know, we had a move, we want you to be out of there. Right. You know, spin move, you behind us, I'm in front, you know. So right. Um, I would he's say more so, shifty. Yeah, Kemba goes somewhere and he stops and changes direction right. and he loses you. Right. I think you have more of like the I'ma stand in one place and I'ma right. just shift. Right. Like an Iverson cross. Yeah. There's a difference between that type of shiftiness yeah. and like I'ma just go somewhere yeah. and stop. So Kyrie has the best mix of both. Yeah. 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 And he goes through traffic like it's nothing. And he's strong. A lot of people don't realize how strong Kyrie is, but I knew yeah. it when I saw him. And then I see some of the things that he does with his off arm where people can't yeah, move yeah. and get back in front of him. So I'm right. like, this strong. Yeah, he's he's real basketball strong. Like, he's not going to move weight in the weight room. but He's strong, bro. He knows how to hit you. Like, yeah. he knows when to hit. He yeah. knows how to use his body. Yep. That shoulder go right through that, you know, that spot yeah. in your, your stomach. Like, it hurts. It hurts, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay, next question. Um, who would be your toughest one-on-one -on -one matchup? In the NBA? No, 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 no. Oh. There's a lot of them. I was about to say. <laughs> There's a lot of them. Okay, so social media. I'm talking YouTubers. I'm talking trainers. Who's your toughest matchup? I beat him already, but I think it's Bone Collector. Yeah, he's and, tough. And, you know why? It's because he fouls you. Mm. And he, he knows it, too. he got grown man strength. He don't care. He he, yeah. he lets you know that he does because he's, like, holding you. Yeah. And so, like, but the thing is, what people don't realize about him, he's super strong. Yeah. Like, really I can, strong. I can tell. I can yeah, look at so, him and tell. 
So like I feel like that would be uh Well and he's bone collector, so you're not gonna call the foul as much. Yeah. You know, I know. He, like if he says not a foul, you're bone collector. You're right. <laughs> so so when we play, we play it was me, uh bone collector, J Law. I yeah. it's on film. Yeah, I remember seeing the highlights. Filet, Austin Mills pulled up. And I didn't really put it in the in the score. I didn't put the score up there like that, but like I won by a lot. Mm. That game. I saw the foot, I won by a lot that game but um it started off with bone collector he pulled up on me he pulled up to the gym and he was just like and we're trying to just do horse it was like with the nba and they were like we're just having some horse games some free throw contests this and that and bone collector pulled up with his with his trainer and and they were like doing stretches on the sideline and he was jogging up and down the court and we're filming and so everybody's like what the heck is he doing so he comes on the court he's like hey yo like hey we're trying to set up the new event. He's like, no, nah, let's just play five on five. And and Jason Gil Gilfin, he's like, we call him Jay Gill. Jay Gill's like, no, 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 we gotta we gotta do this. And then he's like, no, 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 but it'll be more viral if you know we play five on five. And everybody's just kind of looking around. Like Jay Jones, he has his like you know shoes that he don't even hoop in or whoever. Like everybody was there, and it was just like Jay Gill was like, okay. And so we ended up playing five on five. So we played five on five, and then afterwards the one on one started, and it went. It we wasn't planning on doing it. Bone collector came up to me and he put the ball on my chest. He was like, "All right, let's play ones." I'm like, "Nah, bone. We've been here all day. It's been five hours, whatever, six hours. We've been filming for a long time, and then we played five on five. Like I ain't got it like that no more. Mm -hmm. And so even the cameraman, they were done. So he he's just like, "Nah, come on. Like we don't. We will never get to do this type of stuff again. Like bone collector." To give you some backstory, Bone Collector, I study him more than anybody. Like my favorite, my favorite player is Nick Van Exel. I study mm -hmm. Bone Collector more than anybody. Yeah. I'll watch his, his videos at uh, EBC uh, and all these other places like that he used to play at, right? And he was one of my favorite players ever, even though he didn't make the league. And so when he said that, it was like. All right, let's play. Because, like, how my knees are set up, you know? Like, <laughs> uh, all right, whatever, we'll play. And so I get out, rocket step, boom, he's out of there to lay up. And he and he didn't know what happened. He still, he called me that night. He was like, what did you do? Yeah. I was like, I can't, you know, all my secrets now. <laughs> so then I hit a jumper and I hit another jumper. Boom, 3 0. So he fouls me so hard on the next play. And then, and then kind of like, okay. Famous Lopes was there. Jordan Lolly came on the court. Oh, y'all playing one? You know how energetic yeah. he is. Filet came, and then we just started running the ones. Yeah. It was a lot of fun, though. I love it. It was a lot of fun. That's good stuff. Okay, last question. Where's the state of the training game going, like skills trainers? So, like, when you and I get, got in, there wasn't really a North Star. It wasn't like, oh, I'm going to do what these guys are doing. Like, there's people who were trainers, but independently – there wasn't a lot of guys making a lot of money. And so when people got in, like when I started, I had a lot of friends being like, oh, what, you're like a PE coach or like, what do you do? <laughs> like, how do you make a living off that? And I'm like, no, nah, I think I can PE do it. <laughs> Bro, everybody thought I was a PE coach. That just sounds funny now, a PE coach. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> so like, and, and there was no proof that I could be like, well, yeah, but this guy, this guy, this, they all make a full-time living. Yeah. It, it was almost like we were kind of trying to create that. Um, do you feel like this is going to be just like, th is this the start? Is it just going to go crazy? I'm almost afraid of what will happen in like 10 years because, and we talked about this, whereas we would finish playing basketball, most people were just like, hey, y'all, like, no, nah, I'm done. Like, I'm going to go get the job. Now people are just like, well, I'm a train. Yeah. But there are some guys that are teaching about like how to be tough and how to handle pressure and what to do at the off form. And I know them. And I remember when it was a full court press and they would cough it up every time. <laughs> so I'm like, well, wait, hold on. <laughs> so so for me, like I wasn't I didn't average 30, but I'm one that's willing to tell you right off top that I did, I learned a lot of this. I didn't play like how I do right now. Like, I was always a good one-on-one -on -one player, but I didn't understand basketball. But I'm better now than what I used to be yeah. at my at the height of my prime. And so, you know, looking at where everybody's going, some people are putting out straight garbage and some people are still learning. Mm -hmm. And it's really frustrating because, and I always tell you, there's no school for, for basketball training. Yeah. 
Um, you could you can go take physical or what is it called where uh, you can learn how to do what you do. Yeah, like exercise. Science. Yeah, there yeah. there are things like that, but there's no curriculum or certificate that you get for basketball training. So I'm worried. Yeah. But I'm not at the same time because there are the Pauls out there, the DJs out there, the Jordans out there, the Phil Handys out there, the Rico Hines out there. The, yeah. There's a lot of people. Out, and, and then there's so much information. There's synergy. There's the Drew Hanlon's, out, which shout out to Drew because personally I feel like Drew's the, one of the best trainers out there. Yeah. Like he's very smart. He knows what he's talking about. He he backs everything up with analytics or whatever, but he also watches the game. Um, he, he's gun hole on his guy, so but but big at the time. same time, yeah, but, big time. But, but he knows, we, and we also saw that he can shoot the shit out of the ball. Oh, we right? saw that in person. So yeah. do you remember what what, what started it? Yeah, I'll, it was what? a bet, right? Yeah. So yeah, you guys, I don't remember what the number was, but I still think he said he said he get ninety out of hundred, ninety out of hundred, and we're in and he was betting like ten thousand. Yeah, or something. and so and so this is what happened. So he started shooting. We're we're on a shoot. We're we're doing like the little videos of one minute Adidas yeah. videos, and he gets a ten. He gets a ten in a row, at, and didn't miss one. Yeah, you know. And, and then like they were like, "Oh yeah, we need to start filming." So like he was gonna go make ninety shots. Yeah. And I'm like, okay. Then I started really looking him up. I'm like, oh, this dude used to hoop. <laughs> so because I heard you guys talking about the ten thousand dollar bet. Yeah. And I'm like, hold on, let me get in on this. Yeah. So I, I'm away. I I'm never forget him out that because I'd never seen him shoot. And then he starts shooting. No, like you said he racked off ten in a row, yeah. not warm. And it was, was easy like, too. I was like, okay, I'm out of this bet. <laughs> yeah, it was easy, bro. I was gonna, yeah. I was gonna be out of money. Everybody backed out of the bet. <laughs> yeah, he could no dude. Could, yeah. You know, you don't go set records at a college level. You catch him and Tyler. Yeah, you no, know, they could. They yeah, both. Tyler can shoot. They can let. They can yeah. really let that thing go. So I had a right. whole lot of respect for guys like that. And so he's making programs, but. Where Drew Hanlon is also making programs, there's somebody random that's also making a program that ain't ain't got nothing to do with nothing. And this right. whole uh, YouTube generation, like what I realized is I'm kind of a pioneer now, mm -hmm. you know, because I was making those documentaries. And when I look at like younger guys' documentaries, they fairly look the same. Yeah. And I don't mind that. It's yeah. just that, you know, I don't because my videos weren't that good. But if you're you have to put information you have to really study this stuff, and people want to be famous so bad. Yeah, well, it they skip be. the steps. They skip yeah. the work itself. Stop focusing on becoming famous. It's not all what you think. Mm -hmm. Focus on getting money or something, but like, or, or really educating yourself. But yeah. like, just everybody's trying to skip the steps and be famous so bad. Follow me, you know. Click like. Let me do a collab with you, bro. Right. And it's just like, no, 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 like. Why don't you just do your your homework first yep. and build yourself up before you start trying to do all this other stuff? You can't skip steps nope. because the curtain always gets pulled back, always. and it's either you got clothes on or you butt <laughs> butt naked, you know. And, and and so I've seen a lot of people get challenged by guys who really knew what they were talking about, mm -hmm. and and they and they got laughed off of the set and then they were never invited back onto the court. Yep. And so, yep. you know, that's me. I never want that to happen when players come because players will challenge you. Yeah. Players will, people will challenge you. And if you don't know what you're talking about, you, you know, you're going to expose yourself. And right. so going back to where you're, what you were saying, I'm excited for the future and nervous for it at the same time, because everybody thinks that it's their gift. And it's not. Mm. It's yeah. not their gift. Yeah. You know, and so, uh, and there's so many other things that they probably could be doing, but they're trying to force the basketball agenda and, and they're and they're connecting themselves to kids. Mm -hmm. And, you know, kids. Yeah, I've had a lot of interns who, I had a lot of interns who said they're passionate about this. Yeah. But then a couple months in, down, you know, they're waking up at 6 a.m. At some point, it's like, uh -oh. Oh, I don't know, how passionate? Because you I still really? want to party and do all that stuff yeah. at the same time. And, and sometimes it don't work like and that. And what, what I find out is they're passionate about training themselves. Yeah. They like getting in the gym. They like lifting weights. They like looking better. But when it comes to now it's not about you, it's about making them better. They're not actually passionate about that. Yeah. You start to tell with the 6 a.m. over and over and over again. And then it's like, dude, if you're not passionate about this, it's going to be really tough for you to, for example, to make this long term. For example, I'm not passionate about coaching. I yeah, hate coaching. Me too. You know why? Because I have to deal. Coaching is almost about people management too yep. and ego management. And so with training, I, I control more of that. So like 
if I don't want a parent to come, like, don't come. Yeah. I'll just tell you, if you got a problem with that, oh, well. Right. But, like, with coaching, I can't tell you. To do that. And then on top of that, you're dealing with people who are coming from this direction and this walk of life and this household. And it's, you have to make all that come together. And you have so many ideas. But, like, I, I have a lot of information. But I don't have to, I don't have the patience to be able to manage twelve different personalities that are trying to get a scholarship or trying 100%. to get this amount of money. Yeah. And, and so you know my passion is training because I get to like flesh things out. It's kind of like reading a book. You read it at your own pace or watching the show. Yeah. You read it at your own pace. Yeah. Um, instead of being forced to do it. Right. So for sure. All right, my man. I appreciate you being on. We got to be at like the two hour. All right, we're, we're one thirty. Ooh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> uh, where can the people find you? Dev in the lab on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, in the lab on YouTube. You got the academy, right? Yeah, in the academy. You go to inthelab TV. We got all kind of gear on there. I know I'm throwing a lot right now, but season two dot in the lab TV is where we uh on the inside the academy we teach teach you how to dribble, pass, shoot, play yeah. basketball, IQ basketball dictionary. We have, you know. If you really want to learn, learn terminology. And I try to do that inside the academy. It makes it basketball a lot easier. So. Mm -hmm. 100%. Thanks for being here, my man. All right. Yes, sir. For sure.